actually. Um, I started noticing the symptoms of fibromyalgia probably around 18, I would say. Um, didn't quite know what it was, really. I just uh, kind of thought it was normal aches and pains. I was sick or something like that. And then it, it started getting really bad probably a couple years later. Um, but uh, yeah, I just wasn't really remember asking questions or do I just kind of ramble on? <laughs> well, um, you have fibromyalgia, you have pain. Describe your day. Uh, well, it, you know, I heard this story once actually, and it's. Um, this girl and her friend, they're sitting in a restaurant, um, and she's asking her to describe what her fibromyalgia feels like, like a day. And she tells her, okay, go and grab all the spoons that you can find. And so she does, and there's like maybe 20, 25 or something like that. She's like, okay, this is all that you can do within a week, basically, or, you know, a couple days or whatever. And she's like, okay, so tell me what you do when you wake up. And she's like, well, I get up and I take a shower. And she's like, okay, we'll take a spoon away. And she's like, okay, then I make breakfast, and she's like, that's another spoon. And then, <laughs> and then she talks about just like getting dressed and like everything that you do, you have to take another spoon away. So that's basically what it's like, and she's saying like, well, I feel like I want to keep more spoons because I don't have that many left. And she's like, yeah, well like, with fibro, you really have to pick and choose what you want to do with your day. Like, you can't just do all your errands, all your chores everything in the house, it's not that simple for us. Like, we have to pick priorities and, like, you know, the ones that are most important at that time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's kind of what a day in the life of a fibro sufferer is like. And also, just the symptoms too, like, for me, my muscles get really, really tense, and then I just start to shake because they're just so balled up. So I used to have, um, a company actually like a little side business doing nails um, and there's a lot of fine details and fine work that I have to do with that and the worst days that I had <laughs> um, keep going mm -hmm. Just keep going okay um, on the days that were the worst um, I, I really had to kind of reschedule my clients to do nails because um, if I was doing a design like Aztec, for example, you have to hold your hand mm -hmm. so still to do lines like that. So I found that super frustrating. And especially like mostly in my neck and I find my hands shake a lot. Um see like yeah. right now. <laughs> it's, it's so bad. You're but, all um yeah, and especially like my legs too. Um I find the days that it gets so bad where my bones hurt are the worst. Like there's days where I'm just like muscle soreness, but the days that like my bones, it feels like it's like, like my bones are breaking right from the middle mm -hmm. or something, you know, like on the really bad days, so it's lovely. And then there's chronic fatigue, like you're always tired because you're not sleeping well. Um, so I usually try to linger the waking up process so I can maybe get like an extra 20 minutes here or there because it's typically just a couple hours is all that I really sleep in a night. <laughs> so, yeah. Why do you need housing? Well, with a fibromyalgia, it's hard to maintain a steady job because um, I don't know what tomorrow's going to be for me, like soreness. Um, I could have a great day, you know, yesterday and be able to work and do 110%, and then the next day I could just be so, like, in so much pain that I can't get off the couch or out of bed. Um, struggle even just to like get up and go to the bathroom or get a glass of water, you know, stuff like that. So I wouldn't be able to go to work on days like that. Um, so I'm depending basically on disability for an income to support, you know, my bills and credit card and stuff like that. So I don't get enough money from disability to really support myself as an individual because, you know, housing is, prices are going up so much for rent. It's really hard to keep up with that and to take care of your bills, your rent, you know, your necessities, anything. And then by the time that's said and done, even if I could afford um, rent and car insurance and a phone bill, plus everything else like food, um, I wouldn't have any money left over to do anything for me. Like just going out to a movie or something, like that wouldn't be possible. Um, 
so then as a result of that, I think it kind of depresses you a little bit, you know, because you're kind of stuck in cabin fever mode, like you're, you, you're shacked up in your house, you don't want to go anywhere, you can't do anything, so uh, right now I'm just, I'm like, I'm living with my parents and they've been very great, like, in helping me and supporting me, um, but, you know, I'm 22, I want to have a life, but I can't do that with just disability, um, I need help, you know, and that's the reality of it, is I just, I can't do it by myself. Good. Yeah. Good. Good. Um, I actually, um, in the email yes. that, that I did before, I kind of told you a little bit about my yes. background. Should I talk about that? If or? you want to, you totally can. Okay. Um, I just think it would be kind of important for people to hear about it. Because um, I think my symptoms started mainly after I kind of had some traumatic experiences. Um, so throughout the course of high school, I'm not really used to talking about this, I haven't really before, but um, throughout high school I encountered someone that was very unpleasant, um, just at some party that I went to. You know, my drink was kind of drugged and then, you know, I woke up to him doing some things. And um, after that, he just kept on showing up, you know, like, couple times a week he would just I, and I never knew how he found out where I was like maybe it was a cell phone thing but a stalker. yes exactly a very mentally unstable stalker um, and very abusive physically and sexually um, as a result of that I ended up dropping out of high school um, I just found like I couldn't go to school and I was scared that if I did go to school then maybe he was gonna show up there and like hurt one of my friends or, or something like that so I, um, I really started to shack myself in, um, and the thing about any kind of trauma is that it doesn't just hurt you mentally, it hurts me physically too. Like if I'm, mm -hmm. if I'm thinking about something that's really got me in a deep place, then I find that it shows up physically. Mm -hmm. Like I get more sore, you know, you know what I'm talking about. So kind of the more depressed you get the more you hurt but the more you hurt the more depressed you get so that in turn is like another way that we have a really hard time supporting ourselves but right. so basically from this experience that's kind of when I started noticing the really bad symptoms anyways um, when I was 18 yeah I think that's when I started getting really bad um, I, I probably had symptoms like soreness before like 15 or, or 16 or something like that but um, it was just such a constant normal thing for me to wake up sore, so I never really noticed it until it got to the days where I couldn't move or do anything. So, um, I, that event is now out of my life. He's, he's gone, um, thankfully, but I never really told anybody about it um, until I started going to therapy because it was really affecting me. Um, and I'm, I'm still doing that right now. Um, sorry. Everybody's good. Yeah, yeah. Therapy's okay. good. <laughs> yeah, so I, like, I mean, it really helps. At first I kind of thought, like, I don't want to talk to anybody about this. Like, you're a stranger. I have a hard enough time, like, talking to my friends about it. Um, and there was one friend that I've had since elementary school that um, that knew about it as it was going on. And he was very supportive. Yeah. Um, very great. Really good friend. And, um, yeah, support systems are so important. I think. Well, you don't want to tell your friends about it because your friends will, be, will judge you. Yeah, or there's the yeah. common, you know, why don't you just go to the cops? Like, why don't yeah. you just tell someone? And it's, it's really not that well, simple. Well, no, then you have to explain the whole thing to the cops, and the cops will half the time won't even believe what you're saying, right? Exactly. Like, yeah. they can be very condescending, yeah. and they can be very, like, well, why should we believe you? Or, you know, why would I come into a station and tell you, like, why would I waste my time? Like, Especially if you, if you hit a cop this opposite sex. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's that's very difficult. Um, yeah. <laughs> for sure. But mm -hmm. um, I think it's important for people to know, and especially people my age, you know, to accept it and be okay with it. Like, you know, if you're mentally hurting, if you're physically hurting, like, they kind of go hand in hand. I think it's important to try and figure out what's going on there and, like, try to fix yourself and solve yourself. Because no one else can do that for you. Mm -hmm. you got to do it yourself, and you got to want to do it yourself. Um, but just awareness for this whole thing is so important um, you know like if you're noticing physical pain after a mental trauma 
check it out, you know, like, because if doctors, if you've got a good doctor, they're going to want to help you and they're going to want to solve it and, you know, make your days bearable at least, you know, so um, it's important to get help for that kind of thing and seek out support wherever possible, definitely. Okay.